The Candidates Debate. Sponsored by today's TMJ4, WBWM, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and USA Today Network. From the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee campus, here are your moderators. And good evening and welcome. I'm Charles Benson from today's TMJ4. And I'm Shannon Sims from today's TMJ4. Tonight, the governor's candidates face off for the final debate before the elections November 6th. I'm Mitch Tyke from WUWM, and let's welcome the candidates to the stage. We have the current incumbent governor and Republican, Scott Walker, and his challenger, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Democrat Tony Eagle. We are streaming live on Twitter. Just follow the hashtag you see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll pick at least one question to ask during the debate. Candidates, candidates, the rules are very simple. You'll get 90 seconds to answer a question and 30 seconds to follow up if necessary. Now, if you run out of time or over time, you'll hear this. Now, before we start tonight, we really want to take a question from one of our viewers and our listeners, and it stems from the recent arrest of a man in Florida who was accused of mailing pipe bombs to several high-profile Democrats. Political tensions are high as the election day approaches. You can see the question on the monitor behind you. I will read it, and it is a question that says, quote, I would like to know how each of them will appeal to all of their constituents, especially those who don't agree with them, or more simply, what is their plan to heal the partisan divide? Mr. Evers, you will go first. And thank you very much. Thanks to uh, WTMJ and the other sponsoring uh, organizations for tonight, and thanks to the people of Wisconsin for being here and, and listening in, and of course, to, of course, to the audience. And of course, welcome to uh, Governor Walker. Good to see you. And I, I guess it wouldn't be a debate if you weren't here. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway um, this is a really serious issue. I mean, clearly, we had a situation over the last couple of days that was very trying for our country and a very difficult time. And. And uh, I hats off to the law enforcement officers and people in law enforcement that are bringing this to a conclusion. But the most important thing is that people should have the right to make sure that no matter what issues they're talking about, whether it's religious or, or uh, politics, they, they don't have to fear for their lives or their safety. That's critically important to me. And as far as to this is around tone, and uh, my wife and I, Kathy, and our three kids have had a chance to live all across the state of Wisconsin. And I can tell you, every place we've gone, whether it was Baraboo or Toma or Oakfield or Oshkosh, any place, raising our kids, doing, doing what we did at work, we absolutely believe that what, is, what unites us is far, far more important and more, uh, more important than what divides us. And I'm an educator. That's the way I'm going to be take, t operating as a governor of the state of Wisconsin, seeking common ground, making sure that, that we, we talk about what unites us. Mr. Walker. Thanks, and a great question. I think, first off, to do more what we're doing tonight, to have a discussion on the issues and compare our experiences, to have that kind of dialogue as opposed to anything personal. Tony and I worked together with uh, report cards in the past, and I hope we'll be able to work together in the future, no matter what happens on Election Day. But I spoke out very clearly on, uh, on Wednesday when we first heard learn, learned about these devices. I said, an attempted terrorist attack against any American is an attack against every American and that we need to stand united against terrorism no matter where it's at. In fact, I said, if you take on one of us, you take on all of us, no matter what the political background, no matter what your religious beliefs. I think that's incredibly important for members of both parties to say that. I, I personally know how important that was, because years ago, in the midst of the protest, I remember when Tonette and I had threats against us. I remember when our kids, Matt and Alex, were targeted on Facebook. I remember when there were mobs of people surrounding the house we lived in on Wauwatosa when our elderly parents were there. I didn't hear people speak out about that then, and the good news is we got past that. After the recall election, I wisely listened to Tonette when she said, you know, you got to bring together people based on food. And so the week after the recall election, we had what the media dubbed a beer and brat summit. 
We cooked brats and had beer. I even made an Italian sausage for Peter Barca, who, like my wife, is Italian. And that's how we brought people together. And it's, it's about talking together and socializing together. And I'm confident. So I travel the state. One of the things I'm so proud of is to see how proud people are of their communities and their homes, their families, and places of work. And yes, we are proud of our state. And together, together, we can keep moving Wisconsin forward. So let's keep with the theme of viewer questions and talk about a topic that's top of mind for many voters across the state, which is health care. Mr. Evers, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed or eliminated by the courts, how will you protect pre-existing conditions if elected? And you are a supporter of Badger Care for All, but would you also support, as California and Vermont have tried, a state-run Medicare for All in Wisconsin? Health care is on the, on the ballot this, this uh, November 6th. It's an important issue. And it's important for some very good reasons. Um, when Governor Walker decided to run for president, he told, he told the people of Wisconsin he wouldn't abandon them. And as he was running, he made it clear that he was against the Affordable Care Act. And as a result of his political ambitions, he did not take the Medicaid money that the federal government uh, provided. That's $1.1 billion that was left on the table. That's an extraordinary amount of money. And it would have, you know, there's a reason why Minnesota has cheaper health insurance than it is in Wisconsin, is because we, don't, we didn't take that Medicaid money. I would take that Medicaid money. In addition, I would be absolutely sure that we continue to make, to have pre-existing conditions protected. We have two, over two million people in the state of Wisconsin, including myself, who, who I'm a cancer survivor. We need to make sure that we have the strongest pre-existing conditions protection possible. I can guarantee that to the people of Wisconsin. Now, I've talked to, uh, I've tried to get uh, uh, Governor Walker to think about this because presently he is in federal court to do away with the F Affordable Care Act and also to do away with the pre-existing conditions protections. We need to know, the people need to know, why you don't drop that lawsuit. So just to follow up 30 seconds on that, would you be in favor for Medicare for All in the state-run program? And then also, I didn't hear anything, you could be faced with this same dilemma that the law is repealed or it's eliminated. How would you guarantee it? Well, first of all, obviously we'd have to have a legislature agree with that. And I think people get it. They, I think it's important. I think this is, a, this is an issue that isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. It's a Wisconsin value issue. I think we can convince Republicans to make that happen. Now, do I believe that we should have some public options down the road? Very possibly. But my focus, I'm not running for president. I'm going to be around a while. We're going, to, we're going to take on this issue of making sure we get that Medicaid money and have good health care in the state of Wisconsin. Mr. Walker, you have said, quote, as long as I am governor, I will always cover pre-existing conditions. As governor, how will you protect pre-existing conditions if the ACA law goes away and how will you prevent insurance companies from charging more to cover those pre-existing conditions? Well, let's be clear. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's be clear. We can cover people with pre-existing conditions in this state. We can protect them without protecting the failure that is Obamacare. I called for that early this year in the State of the State address. We work with legislative leaders just like we did on other issues. And going forward, should the courts or the Congress change, we've got a plan to do that going forward. And I want to tell you, it's not just good policy. It's the right thing to do. My wife, Tonette, who is here, is a type 1 diabetic. My mother, who's here as well, is a cancer survivor, surviving breast cancer. And my brother, who's here, uh, has a heart condition. Like so many families across the state, covering people with pre-existing conditions is personal to me. And as long as I've governor, as you said, I will always cover people with pre-existing conditions. The way we do it is similar to what we did with the Wisconsin Health Care Stability Plan. When premiums under Obamacare went up 44 percent this year, we brought together a bipartisan coalition, got Democrat and Republican lawmakers to pass a plan that starting in January, we just got word a week ago, reduced premiums by over 4 percent from where they're at this year and by 10 percent for where they would have been. That's a savings of almost $1,000. That's how we did it. We brought Democrats and Republicans together to solve this issue. Obamacare premiums going up, Washington failing to act. And per what Tony talked about, his plan to do what Minnesota did, when they first did it, premiums actually went up. Back two years ago, the Democrat governor of Minnesota, Mark Dayton, said the Affordable Care Act is no longer affordable. 
And that was because premiums in that state were going up 50 to 67 percent. Our plan actually lowers premiums, increases choices, particularly in rural areas, and helps improve health care. I appreciate you spelling out that premium plan. However, one of the big pillars of the Affordable Care Act is to protect those who are not protected by either an employer mm -hmm. or the government. Both of the examples that you gave in regards to First Lady Tonette, your mother and your brother, either government or employer, we're talking about those who fit outside of that gap. How will you guarantee that if Obamacare is repeal repealed, that you have a plan that they will be protected? Right, and my point on that, it's the same way we did with the health care stability plan. We brought Democrats and Republicans together. That's going to be a constant theme tonight. You see, Tony talks a lot about these ideas. We've actually delivered on them. It's the difference between talk and real leadership on health care, on education, on all sorts of other issues. There's a difference between talking about it and delivering on it, just like we got Democrats and Republicans together to pass the health care stability plan to lower your premiums and increase your choices. We'll do the same should there be a change in the courts or in the Congress when it comes to pre-existing conditions. We will always cover them in this state. All right, we're going to move along to education now, and this question will be for both candidates. Um, six years ago, the state convened a bipartisan task force called Read to Lead to improve literacy scores in Wisconsin. The opening sentence of this report stated, quote, there is no skill more important to future success than reading. But scores are falling, not just in reading, but in math and science, too. And now less than half the state's students are listed as proficient in those three fields. What happened to the bipartisan promise of read to lead? And Mr. Walker, we'll start with you. Well, overall, for us, attacking not only reading, but education in general is a priority, not just for student success. You know, my kids went to school in public schools down the way here in Wauwatosa. My nieces are in public schools not too far away from here. I, I want great educational opportunities for every student in the state, whether they go to a traditional public school, a private school, a charter school, a virtual school, or even a home school. Every child deserves access to a great education. And so in this last budget, we invested more actual dollars into K-12 through education than ever before, an extra $200 for every student in every school in every part of the state of Wisconsin. We put additional money into rural school districts to help those unique challenges. We added more here in Milwaukee uh, to help with summer school. And we've done a whole series of things to not just focus on reading, but the whole spectrum of issues out there. In fact, at the time, it was such a good budget, Tony actually called it a pro-kid budget. We adopted largely what he asked for. It was his budget request. And so I thought at the time he'd be pretty happy with it. He was. He called it a pro-kid budget. But what was interesting, though, is after we introduced it, and the, the pundits in, in Madison said, well, there's no way the legislature is going to pass this, well, he kind of faded away. And instead, we went out and visited 50 schools across the state. We worked with the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, and, and equally as important, we worked with small business owners across the state who were telling us time and time again, we need, we've got jobs, we just need people with the skill sets to fill those. And so we worked together to, and I signed at the end of last summer, the, the budget that had the largest actual dollar increase in education funding in the history of this state. More actual dollars, $11.5 billion than ever before. Well, so, so just to follow up briefly, with all of those priorities that you describe, what was it that, it, what, what do you ascribe the, the fall in test scores over the past you know, six, eight years to? What's, what's getting in the way? Well, I think it's a series of things, and again, it's why putting more resources in the classroom and really starting out early. You know, one of the things not only with reading, but with more than anything, in addition to a great teacher and great support from the parents and other things, uh, all of our students need to have hope. They need to have hope that what they're going to do is actually going to lead to something. They can see their future out there. And so I think giving earlier experiences, youth apprenticeships have nearly tripled since I've been governor. I want to move them into seventh and eighth grade. I want to get our students interested early on so they can see the courses they're taking apply to what their future is going to be. All right, Mr. Evers, it's uh, now your turn to answer the, uh, the initial question. What happened to the bipartisan promise of Read to Lead? Well, it was that Read to Lead actually followed Scott Walker's taking $800 million out of our public schools when he first became governor. And also talking about teachers, about dividing and conquering, and frankly, making the teachers the enemy of the, of the people of Wisconsin, especially as it, as it related to the governor. In addition, right now, school boards have less money, less state money, than they have ever had. 
when Scott, or since Scott Walker has been in office. So we can maybe talk about a one-year fix, but that one-year fix didn't get us back up to what it was when Scott Walker took office. There's a reason for there's why there's dysfunction around this issue of education. It, it, is so, it is so part of our core of Wisconsinites. We want to make sure we have a good education system. I put pieces in my budget that have never been approved by Governor Walker. I now have a, a, a budget that I know will change the way we look at success in the state of Wisconsin. It's going to go to two-thirds funding. We're going to be funding mental health. We're going to make sure that every kid has a good teacher and, and a good principal. Those things are critically important. But I, I will say, now, Governor Walker talked about early childhood education. It is important. But in the poorest zip code in the state of Wisconsin, we have no high quality early childhood programs. That's going to be in my first budget next, next January, and I can't wait to implement it. Mr. Walker, the high school graduation gap continues in Wisconsin. The most recent number shows 67 percent of black students graduating in four years versus 92 percent of their white peers. As governor, what action plan do you have to close the high school graduation gap, especially in metro cities like Madison and Milwaukee? Well, again, that, that really follows uh, my answer in the last question. It goes back to providing that kind of hope by giving uh, early experiences uh, within school so that our students start thinking about right after we've, we've now funded academic and career plans statewide through state government in sixth grade, I want to get those youth experiences or those work experiences, I should say, for our youth uh, with youth uh, apprenticeships, with co-ops, with early opportunities to, to identify where their careers are and give them hope for the future out there. I think one of the biggest challenges to making sure that every student graduates in this state and that every student graduates with a game plan for their career is getting them interested early on. You know, youth apprenticeships, as I said, statewide have nearly tripled since I've been governor. They're up to about 4,300. Unfortunately, here in the city of Milwaukee, I think they've gone from about 21 to 80. I've challenged the Milwaukee public school system to say, we'll, we'll pay for as many as you can get. I'd love to do every child, every student at uh, Bradley Tech, for example, where I visited a number of times to talk about youth apprenticeships. I'd love to have every one of them, every one of them be involved in our youth apprenticeship program. I've seen the success elsewhere across the state of Wisconsin. The other part of it, though, is you've got to make sure schools have the resources, not just in total dollars, but the resources to put in the classroom. Our reforms have saved schools in the state more than $3 billion. Tony wants to undo those reforms. That would take money out of the classroom, away from students, and he'll allow your property taxes to go up to pay for it. I think that's a giant step backwards. Okay, Mr. Evers, the state has expanded access to private education through public dollars with the voucher program. However, voucher schools have much more autonomy than their public school counterparts, and advocates for public education say this is unfair. What new standards or requirements would you propose the assembly pass to create an even playing field? It's a great question. As the people of Wisconsin know that uh, we've been experimenting with uh, the voucher program here with our private schools for uh, a very long time, more than, more than a couple decades. And um, for the most part, I would say the, uh, the experiment has not shown uh, any, any dramatic improvement in achievement for kids in either area. We need to focus on the, the kids that are, the kids are the most important thing here, not about how, what, who's in charge of schools and who isn't in charge of schools. And, you know, I worked very hard, actually, with the, with the voucher advocates in the state of Wisconsin to create an accountability system, to create the ability for them to be tested with a state test. So I, I guess I do have some experience working across the aisle, and, uh, and people understand that. But going forward, what we need to do is make sure, yes, those, those report cards and accountability must be in place, but I also believe that transparency cleans the air out of this issue. People in the state of Wisconsin are all paying for uh, publicly funded private schools now. I believe every tax, I believe every taxpayer on their private, uh, property bill should be able to see the, 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 the issues about, okay, the school district is taking this much out of your t tax bill, the municipality, and how much goes for voucher schools. I think that's exceedingly important if we're going to take a look at making sure that all kids learn well. We have to have transparency. Thank you. 
We're going to move on to a new topic now. Let's talk higher education. Uh, Mr. Walker, you've touted the state's university tuition freeze a benefit to young people seeking higher education. Uh, but as we talk on the second largest campus of the University of Wisconsin, how do you balance keeping higher education affordable with the need to attract and retain uh, world-class faculty in schools like this one and live up to the Wisconsin idea? Well, first off, I'm proud that we have one of the best university systems in the country. In fact, the budget right now for the University of Wisconsin system is the largest they've ever had overall. And you look at great institutions, whether it's here at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, not just on this campus, but I visited the School of Freshwater Sciences many times before. We've, in fact, my son lives just down the block from the School of Public Health. We, years ago, when I was a county executive, was involved with the UWM Innovation Plaza out in the county grounds. There are many exciting and dynamic things happening, not only for our students and faculty, but for the integration with helping to build the workforce and add value uh, to this entire community and to the entire state. Going forward, though, I want to make sure that we can make college affordable for every student. You remember in the, the decade before, the decade before our freeze, tuition went up 118 percent. For six or eight years, we've frozen tuition. We think it's critically important to make it affordable for students and the hardworking families that support them. And I want to do it for the next four years. I've increased need-based financial assistance so that both our colleges and universities of all sorts, public and private, can have access to a great education. And keep our graduates here. I want to make sure that, that, that we do that. And so I proposed providing up to $5,000 in tax credits for any graduate of a two-year or more public or private institution that's willing to stay and work here in the state of Wisconsin. We can do all that and more as we continue to provide resources for our UW system, not just to keep it affordable for our students, but as you said, Mitch, to, to keep our top talent here and to, to build off of that going forward. Mr. Evers, uh, we'll move on to you with a similar question. How do you balance the need to support the Wisconsin idea with the need to make it accessible to the state's lower and middle class students, but also provide the things the universities need to stay competitive? You bring up the Wisconsin idea. I think that's a, a good example of uh, working behind the scenes to change things in the state of Wisconsin. As you know, uh, when the last budget was put together, uh, uh, Governor Walker and his, his folks that were preparing the budget actually uh, tried to mess with the, with the Wisconsin idea and took out things like seeking the truth. Um, I think, that's, I think that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's an embarrassment for the state of Wisconsin. People talked about it all across the country. This is a great question. I, we, we have to make it affordable for everybody. We should be able to refinance loans, just like we make sure that young people can refinance loans, just like they do a car or, or, or home mortgage. We have to be able to do that, and there's lot, lots of bills out there that I would support to make that happen. But most importantly, the reason that we're in this predicament is that early on, Throughout and throughout uh, his his career as governor, Scott Walker has taken 250 million dollars out of the University of Wisconsin system. The correctional institutions of the state get more than in University of Wisconsin. We need to reinvest in the University of Wisconsin system. If we freeze tuition, I think for, tuition is too high. I would like to see it lower. But at the bottom line is, if we don't have state resources, that that gap gets larger and larger, and fewer courses are offered. It's going to take kids longer to get through college, and it's going to make their debt higher. The state needs to make a commitment to the most important economic development in instrument we have in the state. Uh, just a quick follow-up there, 30 seconds for you. I heard you say you're also in favor either of tuition freeze or lowering. I think tuition is too high. If the, state, if the state made their contributions, I, can, I, I believe we can make tuition even lower than what it is. But the, the critical thing is, as tuition rose up before it was frozen, this, this exact same time was when the state, state uh, participation in funding went down. That has to come back up in order to make that happen. All right, gentlemen, the candidates will now have a chance to answer a question from Twitter. We have been streaming with the hashtag you see there on your screen. And again, you both will be allowed to answer this question. 90 seconds to respond. I'll read it. Catastrophic floods this year devastated crops statewide. Governor Walker declared a state of an emergency. Extreme weather like this is hallmark of climate change. How will candidates mitigate effects of climate change? And we will begin with you, Mr. Evers. Thank you so much. My background is science. I received a degree from biology and chemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I believe in science. We're going to bring back science to the state of Wisconsin. We have to make, start making decisions based on science. The 
the vast majority of people in the state of Wisconsin, or in, in the scientists, understand that climate change, not only do we believe in it, it's here, and we're seeing it almost daily across this country playing out. I would bring back scientists to the Department of Natural Resources. I would make the Department of Natural Resources Secretary an independent uh, appointment approved by the legislature, and also have an independent board. We need to let science flourish in this state. We need to make sure that we, we, uh, we take a look at our natural resources. Obviously, our water is a big one, but, but in addition, a as we move forward, renewable energy is part and parcel of any any fight against climate change. I will prioritize that. We will make sure that we prioritize uh, economic development around creating good paying jobs that lead to a better state and a better, uh, better life for our, for our kids. This is right on our doorstep. If we don't act now and act in a way that we believe in science and make sure that people understand how important it is and use that to make decisions, we'll be in a much better place. Thank you, Mr. Evers. Mr. Walker, again, how will you mitigate the effects of climate change as governor? Well, I'm an, uh, an Eagle Scout, so I learned a long time ago that your campsite should be clean, cleaner when you leave than when you left it. So I want great natural resources, water, land, air, you name it. Uh, that's important for our state. It's important for our children and our children's children for someday. And when you look at the effects of the changing effects of weather patterns here and around the world, it's a combination of things. And the actions of human beings are one piece of a larger puzzle. I've said for years, one of the best ways to be green is to make green or save green, meaning if you can make things economically sustainable, you can make them environmentally sustainable as well. The two don't have to be uh, competing with each other. And so we've done a number of things to provide incentives to be more energy efficient. In fact, one of the neat things we're working on above and beyond what you might normally think of is actually going out in our training programs that we're providing for people at the end of their prison sentences and to train not just in CNC machining and other things in the trades, but now to work with companies like Johnson Controls from right here in the Milwaukee area. Uh, the train offenders on how to install energy efficient equipment. It's a win-win-win. It helps us all the way around, and there are things we can do like that that help us save energy, save money, and help us get people back up on their feet again. The one thing I won't do, though, is turn over a major, major portion of the state's government to people who are unelected and unaccountable uh, to the taxpayers of the state of Wisconsin. That's what Tony just talked about, turning over a part of state government that years ago was a mess when they waited to see if you got into trouble before they actually worked with you. We want an agency that works with people up front to mitigate these things in the first place. Uh, we're going to turn now to justice reform. Um, and Mr. Walker, First Lady Tanette Walker is an advocate of trauma-informed care and the positive impacts it can have on punishment and rehabilitation of youth. What have you done to gather juvenile justice advocates and lawmakers to ensure that the problems that have plagued Lincoln Hills over the past eight years are not repeated in your plan for local facilities? Well, thanks. And any time a young person commits a violent act, it's, there are no easy answers. You know, for decades, for decades, the state of Wisconsin housed serious juvenile offenders in large-scale facilities, often miles and miles and miles, many long distances from where they came from, from where their families and services were at. That made it difficult to provide specialized care and services. And so that model just really didn't work. And we worked together with not only Republicans and Democrats in the legislature, but we looked at best practices from around the country and put in place a change that changed the model. Looking ahead, as you mentioned, in the future, serious juvenile offenders will be living in small regional facilities, many of which will be in this area, but others will be across the state, where there'll be a focus on a number of things, from providing mental health care services, to providing substance abuse, to looking at the idea of just overall rehabilitation. And not just in these projects, but throughout all of our state agencies, we're now training individuals through trauma-informed care to really get at the source of trauma and understand the impact it has, not just in the people there, but in all the people we work with all throughout state government. So uh, to follow up uh, in 30 seconds, can you talk about how oversight might change in, uh, in the plans that you have for these Well, absolutely. Facilities? Part of it, and one of the things we worked with both Republican and Democrat lawmakers, I remember sitting in Robin Voss's office in the state capitol as we put the pieces together with both Democrats and Republicans from the legislature. Part of it was making sure that our counties were involved. The Wisconsin Counties Association 
played a key role in this. Having once been a county official right here in Milwaukee County, I wanted to make sure they had a seat at the table, not just from the criminal justice standpoint, but also to make sure that for the wraparound services and the other benefits they could provide, those were things that not only they could work on in those facilities, but many more in the future. Mr. Evers, critics say your proposal to cut the prison population in half would be a dangerous plan. That would mean releasing thousands of violent criminals into the community. Can you explain how your plan would ensure public safety? Absolutely. And first of all, I just have to clarify something that was said in a previous question or make people remember. Scott Walker is the governor who scrubbed climate change off of the website of the Department of Natural Resources. That said, corrections is an important issue in the state of Wisconsin. There is a reason why the, the, the guards and the children and, and young people that were at Lincoln Hills were at war with each other for seven years. They had a governor that never visited. In fact, we have a governor presently who said, not only did I not visit prisons in the past and correctional institutions in the past, but by golly, I'm not going to do it in the future. Violent criminals will always stay behind bars. Red states across this country have figured this out. This is, this is a Democratic and Republican issue. It's one that's going to be, going to be, taking, uh, going to be taken care of going forward because of that. Texas has cut back the number of prisons. They invest in rehabilitation. Same thing in South Carolina. We have to make sure that those nonviolent offenders, especially our young people who get in trouble with the law, we rehabilitate them. We may do it without incarceration. We're going to give them the treatment they need, make sure that they have, have vocational training, and get them back into the society before they are incarcerated and never kind of locked, lives are being wasted. I know rehabilitation can work. It works in red states across the country. So let me just follow up on that, Mr. Evers. Are you then talking about going forward to reduce the population? What about the current population? Well, Certainly, if we, if we go forward with this plan, and I'm, I'm, I, I know we can get but bipartisan support population. on, it is the current population. But we will, I will have a pardon board, and we will take a look at those that were convicted of nonviolent, very minor crimes that are, are now wasting their lives in prison. Take a look at those people. We will set up a commission, just like uh, Scott Walker has not done, and take a look at case by case by case. But we have to start someplace, and we have to start with the people going into the system. Okay, moving on to economy. Again, Mr. Evers, this question goes to you. A recent United Way study found that nearly four out of 10 Wisconsin families cannot afford basic needs such as housing, food, health care. And it's not just a wage issue. It's the barriers that include child care costs and transportation. What policy changes would you support to break down those barriers? Absolutely, and, and poverty is is multifaceted. It, we have to be able to, any governor has to be able to connect the dots. Some of it is about corrections policy and justice policy. Some of it is around health care, making sure that we have affordable, and adequate, and accessible health care. Some of it is around, frankly, issues of, of uh, transportation, getting from point A to point B. All these things have to be part of the, part of the situation. But as it re relates to economic development, we have to make sure that we have a sound 72-county economic development policy. We need to make sure that uh, uh, not all economics is just a, uh, a Hail Mary pass for one part of the state, pitting one part of the state against the other. We need to make sure that young entrepreneurs, whether they're in Clark County or Iron County or right here in Milwaukee, have the opportunity to thrive. That's where we still rank very, very low as a, as, as a, as a, as a state. We need to make sure that those young people that want to start a business, that are going to be the, the, our, our bosses of the future and the people that are making good money in the state, hiring people, they have to be at the table. We have to make sure that that happens. In turn, it is clear that, uh, that uh, when we talk about economic development, it can't be just tax breaks to foreign corporations. It can't be just tax breaks to wealthy individuals. We have to reach out and make sure the young people of the state of Wisconsin have a chance to thrive. I'd like to follow that up with, would you also, though, support any wage increase? Because we are talking oh, yes. about families yes. who simply don't have enough for the basic needs and may be doing some of the jobs that many of us consider to be part-time jobs. They have now made them 
their full-time careers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a supporter of a $15 an hour wage increase. Of course, we need to take a look at how that's done over a period of time. We have to make sure it's careful. But I think by the end of my first term, we will be there. Mr. Walker, there is a phenomenon that urban planners and business leaders refer to as the last mile problem, uh, the gap that exists in cities, suburbs, and rural areas when it comes to using public transit to connect workers with where jobs exist. In a time when a seemingly unprecedented number of jobs are slated to come to rural Racine County, how will you use that development to lead the effort to solve the last mile problem? Yeah, it's something uh, we don't just talk about, we've actually led on. Early this year at Quad Graphics, for example, we laid out our Commute to Career program. In fact, State Representative Jason Field, a Democrat, joined us because he knew what an important issue was this was for people in his district here in the city of Milwaukee. And it's important all over the state. And Quad Graphics, they have four to 500 jobs, and we're giving grants to companies like that, big and small like, to make connections in terms of transportation, to get at exactly what you're talking about, to get groups of people who are looking for better jobs or jobs for the first place to where those jobs are. We just did a series of those grants today, not only here in Milwaukee and places like Racine and Madison and Green Bay and Wausau, Oshkosh, others, but we've also done them in Menominee and Sparta, over in Darlington and New Glarus, because there are examples like this all over the state. We do have a 72-county strategy. In fact, it's why uh, just about every county is either at or nearly at the lowest unemployment rates they've ever had. Statewide, we have more people working this year than ever before in the history of the state. Eight months in a row of record or below unemployment, and today over 100,000 job openings, over 100,000 job openings on our state website, jobcenterwisconsin.com. That's more career opportunities in our state right now then we have unemployed people to fill them. So we do have a game plan with our connecting careers to, uh, to people looking for the commute that they need to get there. And we're going to do that not just with Foxconn, but with all sorts of other things along the way. I want to follow that up briefly. Um, just in the last day, there have been stories uh, emerging that there are, I believe it's two suburban job link bus lines mm -hmm. in the Milwaukee area that are in jeopardy. How can the state work with, better with municipalities to ensure lines like that continue to exist at the same time as all these other efforts are going on? Well, our, our, our uh, commute to career program is very specific, because one of the challenges I remember even years ago when I was here in Milwaukee County in terms of transit lines is that they don't have the same flexibility of smaller vehicles out there. And so part of it is looking specifically to where there are groups of people looking for employment and making the connection to where those employment opportunities are at. And by the way, when it comes to Foxconn, they don't earn any of those tax credits over the next decade and a half unless they actually have actual job creation and investment. No jobs and no investment, no credits. The good news is they're far exceeding that. Let's move on to a new topic, immigration. Mr. Walker, qualified undocumented students were once eligible for in-state tuition until you and Republicans revoked it, revoked the law in 2011. Why shouldn't DACA students who graduate from Wisconsin high schools be allowed to pay the same tuition at state colleges? Well, I certainly feel for the students and families involved with this. I've talked to many families in the past, but you know, Wisconsin and America are a nation of immigrants and a nation of laws. Uh, when I think about immigrants in this state, as I mentioned before, we have more people employed in this state than ever before. Or every week and sometimes every day, I have employers tell me I need more people with the skill set to fill those jobs. So we want a legal immigration system in this country. This will help us here in Wisconsin as we need to bring more talent to the state of Wisconsin. But we're also a nation of laws. And, uh, I take an oath in office to uphold the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Wisconsin. And it is clear, under federal law, we cannot offer in-state tuition based on residency for people who are not here legally. That's a federal law. You want to change it? You need to change the federal law. You see, in this state and in this country, we have laws to make sure that people are treated equally in our society, both at the state and the federal level. The minute we start saying we're not going to enforce the laws or not enforce this law versus that law, we start undoing equal protection under the law. As long as I'm governor, I'm going to uphold those laws and push to make changes. And we need to have a comprehensive system going forward out here. You know, Barack Obama was in town today. Years ago, when he was first elected, the Democrats controlled the House and the Senate, and they didn't tackle this issue. Republicans haven't either. Republicans and Democrats need to get together with a bipartisan solution to have a legal immigration system in America that works so states and local jurisdictions aren't pushed up to this issue. What I'll do is focus on the things I can control, and that's building a better opportunity for prosperity and freedom in this state. Mr. Walker, I'd like to follow up just quickly. You, you mentioned that special treatment for 
illegals. However, DACA recipients are documented individuals mm -hmm. who have gone through a certain amount of requirements. And again, they are here not illegally. They have a status and they want to be able to continue their education in the state of Wisconsin. Why shouldn't they? Because the law is clear in the federal level. You cannot provide in-state tuition based on residency for someone who doesn't have a legal status. That's what the law is. Uh, our attorneys have looked at it, others have looked at that. Other states, Tony will talk about other states doing it, they're doing in direct violation or in ways that counter uh, based on residency out there. The bottom line is this is a federal issue and I'm going to stay focused on issues that provide more opportunities and more freedom for people here to make sure that everyone can prosper through more jobs and higher wages. That's what we've done. Eight years ago it was a mess. Today we're much better off. Thank you, Mr. Walker. I will move on to Mr. Evers. State Republicans have tried to end sanctuary cities in Wisconsin. A couple of states, such as California and New York, have tried to become sanctuary states. Do you support sanctuary cities? Would you support making Wisconsin a sanctuary state? I believe sanctuary uh, cities, I believe municipalities are the ones to make those decisions. And if they do, I will support their decision, whether they decide to or not. But I, I want to talk about immigration in general. Um, first of all, uh, Governor Walker talked about not uh, providing uh, in-state tuition for uh, uh, DACA kids, DACA students. Um, I believe, I could be wrong, I believe that at one point in time, Governor Walker actually uh, participated in a, in a budget uh, that did do that and, and uh, voted for that budget. In addition, I've said recently, recently that I think it's very important that the state of Wisconsin uh, provide uh, a driver's permit uh, for uh, undocumented immigrants also. You think about how important undocumented immigrants are to the state of Wisconsin. They work on our farms, they work in our factories, they work in our offices. They are a vital, vital part of our economy, and it's the right thing to do. Now, I will tell you that uh, uh, we have 12 states, and actually 12 states, including Utah, agree with me on that issue, as well as the Wisconsin Farm Bureau. I believe I'm on the right side of both of these issues. Now, over his career, uh, we have seen um, uh, Governor Walker act as a typical politician here, kind of moving around and, and, and making sure that it's different. But if I, was a kid, if I was a teacher giving the multiple choice tests on this, he would take D, all of the above. If elected governor, if I could just have a follow-up for 30 seconds, you may have to uh, address the issue of sanctuary cities. Some states, like California, have gone to sanctuary states. Right. Would you support a, a Wisconsin becoming a sanctuary That's state? That's not a priority of me. My priority is to return, frankly, as much local control that has been taken away from our municipalities to our municipalities. All right, we're going to talk about transportation now. And uh, Mr. Evers, you have said, I believe, everything is on the table when it comes to transportation funding, including a gas tax. Uh, studies show every penny increase in a gas tax would equal $33.5 million in additional revenue. You've also said a dollar increase is ridiculous. So let me ask you, what amount is not ridiculous? Well, I can just reiterate that. I never said that a dollar a gallon increase would be a reasonable solution. It is a ridiculous one. It's diverting, it's diverting attention from some, a very important issue here. We are 44th in the state of Wisconsin, or in the nation as the state of Wisconsin, in our transportation and condition of our roads and our bridges and our, and our, our infrastructure in general. That's not where we want to be as a state. We have a northern Wisconsin, they're taking the asphalt off the roads and going back to gravel roads. I don't think that's a, that's a legacy we want to leave, leave for our kids. So what my goal is as governor is to do this, is to bring people together. Republicans and Democrats get this issue. Scott Walker's line in the sand is what stopped us. We have a 20%, 20 percent of every transportation budget is debt service. People are making money in, Wall, in New York City on Wall Street on our debt. We have to make sure, bring people together, get a solution on the table and, and implement that, that solution. We can no longer have Scott holes all across the state of Wisconsin. We can no longer have bad roads and, and bridges. I was talking to an engineer the other day that talked about, and she was involved in making, uh, building and engineering bridges. Her concern wasn't about money and making sure they make money, more money. Her concern was the safety of the people of Wisconsin. We will get a solution to this, and I'm confident of that. 
Just to follow up briefly, I mean, not, not to trivialize it or, or attach too much uh, emphasis to specific numbers, but, uh, you know, I, I suspect there are Wisconsinites out there. I mean, I, I filled up my car today. I think I paid $2.64 a gallon. And sure. there, there are people who are out there filling up their cars that wonder how much difference there's going to be if Tony Evers is governor. Well, first of all, my, my gut level is that I wouldn't want to increase the gas tax at all. But in any negotiations, when you're bringing people together, you can't, you can't say, let's all come together and we're going to find a solution to this. And oh, by the way, my solution is X, my, my way or the highway. That is not the way we're going to solve this problem. I'm an educator. We always focus on bringing people together for the best solution possible. There are Republicans and Democrats that are waiting to make this happen. Mr. Walker, let's continue on this conversation. The state debt service payment has increased in the transportation fund under your watch. Taxpayers are now paying more to pay off debt. Why should the state continue to borrow more money instead of paying for its road construction needs now? Well, it's a great question. And early on, we had to pay off the more than a billion dollars that Jim Doyle rated from the transportation fund. We invested $24 billion during our time in office versus $21 billion, but part of it was to backfill what Doyle took out of the fund to spend on other things along the way. In fact, our last budget had the lowest level of debt spending on transportation since the budget in 2001. So we're heading in the right direction. But let me be clear, there is a clear difference between the two of us on this. I listened to local officials, like I once was at the county level, and we gave them the largest increase in road aids in 20 years, in 20 years. Just recently in La Crosse and last week in Stevens Point, I made a commitment to bring them up to the highest level in the history of the program. I'm going to pay for that by not doing massive new interchanges here in the Milwaukee area. You see, we've spent more than a decade, starting with Jim, Governor Doyle, and we just finished the core of the zoo interchange, and it's a time to spend that money, the more than a billion dollars around the rest of the state, to spread that money out to all 72 counties. Now, I think you should be troubled any time from Madison tells you they're not going to tell you how much they're going to raise your taxes until after the election. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you should hold on to your purses and to your wallets because it's going to cost you a lot. Tony has said everything's on the table. He said, well, a dollar a gallon, everything's on the table. Well, now he says that's a lie, that's ridiculous, but he's not going to tell you what it is. Well, Governor Jay Inslee, who's going to be campaigning with him tomorrow, a few weeks after he was elected years ago, put a $5.5 billion tax increase on the table. He's in a state where he's pushing a 20 cent a gallon gas tax increase on almost 50 cents a gallon. They have second in the nation. But and it's only me, going to get higher. Let me just follow up on that 30 seconds. Isn't it the same if taxpayers have to pay more for debt, the same as raising the gas tax three, four, five cents? It equals about the same amount. Well, Charles, that is precisely why we've lowered it. We had the lowest level of borrowing in terms of transportation debt in this last budget uh, in nearly a decade and a half, well, almost two decades. You go back to 2001 was the last budget that had uh, borrowing as, as low as it is right now in this budget. But the answer is not, in fact, if you look out there, overwhelmingly people say it's not a gas tax increase, it's not a, vehicle, uh, it's not a vehicle registration fee increase, it's spending that money wisely. And that's why we're going to focus in on local governments, maintaining the roads and the bridges. And the special interest groups spending that we'll money are the ones benefiting off of this. Thank you. We're going to go to Twitter once again for a question. This time, however, you'll only have 60 seconds to answer the question. You can read it on the screen behind you as well. It states, do you support the Unfair Sales Act, a.k.a. minimum markup, law requiring 9.18% markups on gas, along with a 9% markup on alcohol, tobacco, and which is also prohibits most below-cost sales? And I think we're starting with you, Mr. Walker. Well, uh, going forward, I want to make sure when we focus on this, it's not just on laws like that, but, but making sure we promote a healthy economy and reasonable use of transportation. As I was just saying a few minutes ago, I talked about, you know, the groups who are running ads attacking us about the maintenance of our roads are the ads, the groups that benefit, the special interest groups that benefit overwhelmingly from massive new interchanges here in the Milwaukee area and others like them. We want to send those dollars out, out to local governments all across state so that every county and every municipality across the state of Wisconsin can maintain the road just like we're going to maintain our state highways. And the way we pay for it without a massive new tax increase is by focusing on not doing those big interchanges and putting the dollars at the local level. Now we can tackle issues like this and others in the future, but we've got to have a transportation policy that's on the table right now, not one where people say, hey, we'll wait till the next, and we'll wait till after the election, we'll wait till inauguration day. That's what Tony's telling you, just believe him 
and suddenly he'll tell you that taxes are going to be just fine. If I'm a taxpayer, I'm worried about Tony Evers being the governor. Mr. Evers. Well, let's talk about tax increases just for a second. Because of Governor Walker's bad public policy around transportation, 44th in the, in the nation, 44 out of 50, that's a bad deal for everybody. He talks about the fact that the people that are gaining on this uh, transportation issue are the people that the hard people that are doing the work, the engineering and so on, the people that, that uh, gain from having better roads and, and bridges and making sure it's safe are the people of Wisconsin. That's who's getting, getting the benefit here. Now, I just have to tell you, the, the issue of, of the, uh, of the uh, markup taxes, I think that's, that's something we can take a look at going forward. But think about this. Scott Walker's transportation policy has led to another tax. They're called wheel taxes. They're called user taxes. There are 20 municipalities across the state of Wisconsin that are dinging their people for taxes so that they can fix their roads that need fixing. That's a tax. Governor Mr. Walker Evers. owns that. Uh, we're going to move on now to the topic of accountability. And uh, Mr. Evers, the education department you run has been accused by Republicans of multiple instances of plagiarism on school budget plans. In the education world, there are strong penalties when it comes to holding students accountable for plagiarism. How are you holding your department accountable? Well, I have to put this in a context. It's about citations. We have a large budget that we propose uh, every two years, multiple pages, hundreds of pages. And in this case, we did make a mistake. There were some a handful of citations that were left out of a back page of a budget document. Now, is that an, is that an issue? Absolutely. We addressed it with the people that it was a mistake. We addressed the people that made that omission. We're providing training with them so that we can move forward in this, uh, uh, this arena without mistakes again. But again, you just, this, is, this is an issue about a budget. A $1.5 million budget. That's why we're talking about whether a citation is there or not, because Governor Walker doesn't want to talk about the fact that he took $800, or $800 million out of the public school budget. Again, it's a diversion. He doesn't want to talk about the fact that he has four former um, uh, advisors, top advisors to his, to his staff, that have said, geez, I don't think he's fit to be governor. He's somebody that has, has put his own political interests again, again, uh, against the people of Wisconsin. These are diversionary tactics, so we don't have to talk about the issues that trouble him. Mr. Walker, we, uh, as you know, you have been accused by Democrats of using the state plane to fly around Wisconsin for events with taxpayers picking up the cost of nearly 680000 in just the last two years. Again, voters expect accountability. Are you holding your team accountable when it comes to spending taxpayers' money on all these trips? Well, I'm proud to travel the state. I think people in Ashland and Superior, in Marinette, and places all across the state want to see their governor. They don't want a bureaucrat stuck in an office in Madison. They want to hear from and they want to see and they want to talk to. When the question was asked earlier about the flooding, I, I think about all the different disasters we had. Just in this past year, in April, I was up in the Northeast after the big blizzard, looking with farmers who had their farming parlors, milking parlors crashed in. And earlier in the summer, I was up in the Lake Superior Basin, as we had been a couple years ago when they had massive flooding. And obviously, in August and September, we were all over the state when we had floods and 19 different tornadoes. I think it's incredibly important. I love to see not just in instances like that. I've, I've been to school districts as part of our push to approve that budget that had the most actual dollars in state history. I, I went to the places in the far northeast and the southwest that told me they'd never even seen a governor before. I'm proud to travel the state. And I'm going to tell you, if you give me the opportunity to serve as your governor for the next four years, I'm going to travel the state over and over again because I want to see you. I'm proud of the state, and I'm proud to see how people are proud of their schools and of their communities, proud of their hospitals and clinics, proud of their homes and their families, proud of their communities, and proud of this state. I'm proud to be your governor, and as long as I'm governor, I'm going to continue to work together. You pick up good things. You know, the hope agenda that John Nygren and others put together, we heard about that from traveling around the state. Putting more money in the mental health services in our schools, we heard that from traveling.
on state. Putting more money in the broadband, that came from traveling around the state and making sure we addressed our health care stability plan because Obamacare premiums are going up. That happened because we, we traveled to the there, state. We there, Mr. Walker. Uh, each candidate will now get 90 seconds for closing statements. And before we started this debate, we had both candidate draw, candidates draw numbers to determine who would go first. Mr. Walker, you will go first. Well, thank you. And uh, we've come together a long way here in the state of Wisconsin. You know, there are more people working in the state this year than ever before. And that means more opportunities for our graduates to stay and work here. Because of our strong economy, we've been able to reduce the tax burden on our senior citizens and working families, and at the same time, put more money into education, worker training, infrastructure, and health care, and we'll always cover, always cover people with pre-existing conditions. Looking ahead, with your help, we're going to do more to help expand opportunities for Wisconsin workers. We'll, we'll do more to help our seniors afford to stay in their homes, and we'll do more for college students here and other campuses across the state to help control college costs and college debt going forward. We can do all that and more looking ahead, but to do that, we need your help. We need your prayers. You know, we started out focusing on jobs in our first term. Now we're educating and building the workforce we need, and going forward, we need to grow that workforce to finish the job over the next four years. I'm asking for your help and your prayers, and tonight, I'm asking for your vote. I ask for your vote on November 6th, so that together, we can keep Wisconsin working for generations to come. Thank you. Mr. Evers. Well, I'd like to thank uh, the panel for their great questions and, of course, uh, being here with Governor Walker and, of course, the people across the state of Wisconsin. It was a great opportunity for both of us to share our vision for the future. Uh, I certainly appreciate that opportunity. Now, there is clearly a difference of opinion around our difference of vision that uh, Scott Walker and I have around the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Scott Walker has been, you know, a typical politician where he puts himself in front of the people of the state. Um, by the way, I'm not running for president. We will, and because of that, because of his inability to kind of view things from the people of the state first, we've had, we have bad roads, we have a struggling school system that's been politicized, and frankly, we have a health care system that's under attack. Now, the things that are important to me and important to my family are what's important to the state of Wisconsin also. As I said before, I live all across the state of Wisconsin. It's been a pleasure for us. We've been blessed to have that happen. And we know what unites us is far greater than what divides us. And that is, a, that is part of my DNA. I'm an educator. We always focus on what's possible, making sure we find common ground, Make sure we find solutions to problems. I'm a pragmatic guy. That is what I'm going to be focusing on, focusing on this next, next November. Please take a look at my website, tonyevers.com backslash plan. And thank you so much for being here tonight. It's been a pleasure. Mr. Evers, Mr. Walker, thank you very much for being here. Uh, the election is 11 days away. What is on the monitor there says the vote, Wisconsin's future, and so we felt very important to have you both here to talk about your ideas and what you think uh, Wisconsin voters need to know before they go to the polls, even though voting has already begun. I also want to thank uh, the UW-Milwaukee folks for hosting us tonight, and I actually would like to see if we can get a big round of applause, because this has been our hard work. A lot of hard work. stage and on TV, but as you mentioned, there are a number of people behind the scenes who have made this happen. Sure. Um, not only the collaborations with all of our radio partners and our TV partners, but most, most importantly, many of the people here at UW-Milwaukee who made this happen for us. So again, can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> We want to thank everybody who uh, tweeted in questions and who texted in questions ahead of time as well. It's been an engaging debate. It really has. The voters are ready. Yes. Well, you can find complete information of all the candidates running, and please vote November 6th. Again, you can find all the information for the candidates on our website at tmj4.com as well as wuwm.com. Dot com. <laughs> Right. Remember, the general election is November 6th. Don't forget to get out and vote and have yourselves a great night. Thank, Thank you. you.